7.30 p.m. Town Council meeting for March 5th. Would everybody join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call. Councilor Holbrook? Here. Councilor Donovan? Here. Councilor Katarina? Here. Councilor Blaze? Here. Councilor Benedict? Here. Chairman Sullivan? Here. Okay, um, we'll start this off with um, public comments. Three minutes, from <coughs> 11 to 8 o'clock. And name and address, please. Hello, I'm Paul Austin, uh, Three Tide Mill Lane, Scarborough. Uh, I'm the uh, current president of the board of the Scarborough Land Trust. And first of all, I'd like to invite the council and the public to our annual meeting, which is next Thursday, the 13th, at 7 o'clock in these chambers. I know that you've all received a card, a uh, reminder card about that. Um, we're going to talk about a number of things at the annual meeting. Uh, one of those is a historical presentation on Benjamin Farm, which is a big project that we're working on now that I'm sure you're all aware of. Um, another thing that we're going to introduce is uh, a white paper that we did on conservation as an economic engine. I believe you have copies of that in front of you now that Tom passed out. Um, we we have been thinking about this for a little while and we worked on it last winter and we finally have it in a presentable form and I wanted to show it to the council uh, before it's presented publicly at the meeting. Uh, there are many ways that conservation provides an economic benefit to a community. For example, uh, property values in a community that has open space and recreation land tend to be higher. Certainly any property that's near recreation space uh, has a higher value. Uh, the growth and services report from 2000 that the town of Scarborough did uh, indicated that each residential unit in the town cost the town $1,200 a year, which is a, a pretty astonishing figure when you think of it. Uh, but Broad Turn Farm, when we started to think about it, was a, was a very interesting example of how conservation can contribute to the economy. Uh, as you know, the Scarborough Land Trust owns Broad Turn Farm, and we have a, a fairly unique lease, a 30-year lease with uh, Stacy Brenner and John Bliss to lease the farm, and, and they run an organic farm there. Uh, our partnership with them allows them to operate a farm in an urban area where they wouldn't be able to operate. Uh, they wouldn't be able to afford to, to buy a farm in, in this area. It just would be impossible. Um, it's very easy to buy a, a farm in, in potato country, but then you don't have any market. So there, there are some real disadvantages. So this has been a really wonderful, a wonderful uh, possibility for both of us. We have highest and best use of, of a great deal of the farm property, and they have an economical uh, place to, to have a business. Uh, we, when we start, when we start thinking about this, uh, Broad Turn Farm is is really it's a unique operation, and and they're excellent businessmen, and they're they're doing a really great job. But they actually have a number of businesses that happen on the farm. Um, one of them is their community support agricultural program. They have 200 shares this year for the first year, so 200 families or or units of of uh, people can buy, pre-buy uh, agricultural products. They sublease farmland to the Snell family farm, and that's half of the property that Snell's uh, till is at Broad Turn Farm. And John is, is quick to say it's the best half of the land they till, too. Um, they have a wedding business with 10 weddings a year. They have a floral design business. They employ, uh, as you can see here, they have six or seven people that work just on the floral design business. They do three events a week on average. 
Um, they're very, very busy, and they grow in the summer most of the flowers they use. They have a farm stand, a serve-yourself farm stand. They barter for hay with a couple of neighbors, and they have a farm camp there, which is an educational camp for kids. And the really interesting thing when you drill down through this is, as you can see from this chart, there are there is a direct financial benefit to 81 or more people. Um, those are people that derive, in some cases, six or seven months of income from the farm. A few people derive full full term income, but it's a tremendous economic benefit to the town. Their customers. Uh, just in round numbers, are about 760 people that contribute to the various programs. They, they have a wedding, they belong to a CSA share, they send their kids to the farm camp, um, uh, they buy flowers. And, and then, interestingly, <coughs> there's a direct benefit to 4,935 people that directly benefit from the events and the activities at that farm. So that includes wedding guests, the average of 1.75 children in each family that has a CSA share. It's the people that that get uh, produce from Snell Family Farm. They're active, very active in three farmers markets in the Portland area. It's the 300 kids that go to farm camp every year. So I just wanted to give you copies of this and talk about this to show you what you got for your money when you invested in Broad Turn Farm. We're extremely lucky to have that facility and we're even more lucky to have John and Stacy as the tenants there. They're amazing farmers and they, they welcome the community and I'd urge any of you to go to the farm in the summer. You won't believe how busy it is and what's going on there. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. <coughs> Next. Uh, good evening, uh, Katie Foley, Three Lucky Lane. Um, I wanted to start with a uh, thank you um, to all of you for um, slowing down enough to really kind of take all of the committee's recommendations and process them, uh, listen to the vote that took place in December. I think um, I, I still am going to stick with what Jessica said a few meetings ago, and I, I, <laughs> it has stuck with me, and I think she said it best. Um, this is certainly not something that everyone in this room is going to love. Um, I'm sure we're going to get emails tomorrow. You'll get some, I'll get some. Um, but I do think it represents significant compromise uh, and a thoughtful uh, approach. Um, I think I encourage you to stay open um, because I think they're problematic in terms of uh, the parking lots for me. Those are a very clear delineation of, of where you can separate and and educate in a way that's going to be uh, most mindful. So stay open to the comments that continue to come in. Um, I did just want to throw out a couple more pieces that, um, as I was listening to your discussion, kind of came to mind. And I think uh, if you're going to move forward with the inquiry uh, around the portions of the beach to the north and to the south of Scarborough Beach, um, and I can tell you that those were uh, included because there is history of plovers nesting um, at both ends of that beach and those private beaches are not included. So equally consider uh, also inquiring about the possibility of delisting Ferry Beach because it qualifies uh, under those the qualifications that they have listed. And I have provided Tom and everyone with that information of, of what that means. Um, kind of to one of the points <coughs> Jessica was saying or might have been Bill uh, around people getting out of their cars and just letting um, their dogs go. I think that could be something that you work into the language. Uh, I think dogs should be on leash when you get out of the car until you get down to the area where they can be off. And I think the same should be true probably of the paths, uh, especially if those at prime point where it's most problematic and uh, could be closer to nesting areas. So that's something to also consider. Um, I don't know what the number is for you, Jessica, the magic number for at large, but I will say it's something you need to dive a little deeper into. When you look at the dog data I provided, it was certainly the largest percentage of uh, animal calls uh, that our animal control officer was dealing with. Um, 
In terms of language, uh, I know in the Minority Report I also included, and it was a strong suggestion uh, from the attorneys that we've consulted um, along the way, uh, is to be careful to write the, the new ordinance in a way that is restrictive and not permissive in, in its manner. Um, that will also offer the town additional protection. Uh, and then lastly, um, I just wanted to say that, you know, uh, the vast majority of this dogs group um, and myself are still very committed uh, to being a long-term partner to the town. And uh, we want to work with you. Um, and I'm glad that we've come to this place. So thank you. Thank you. Next. Elaine Richer, 5 Brief Lane, 28 East Grand Ave. I just want to echo what was said that thank you very much. Uh, for the off-leash time. It's really very important. Uh, I don't have a dog, but I enjoy seeing them, and I think this is great. The um, one thing that I would, a couple of things I'd mention, first of all, in the co-op beach, with the change in, um, in the ordinance, is there really a reason to have the co-op beach become a, um, a dog-free beach? And I think we've got to two things that were not mentioned that you have to take into consideration. One are the tides, which make it almost impossible at certain times of the day or year for that beach to be even used. The second and most important part is the parking. Parking for the rising tide, for the co-op, for <laughs> the people who have got boats, they need like two spaces to do that in. So if you, if you make something a dog-free beach, you, you have to provide parking and there isn't really anything there. So I think you want to give that some consideration. When you talk about um, beach access and signage, that's great because, again, um, on East Grand Ave, going from East Grand to the beach, there, there is no signage, and I think that's going to help a great deal. One of the problems I do see is the signage that I don't think can be put and that's between the two beaches, Old Orchard and Pine Point. When you, when you cross that line in the sand, and it's a line in the sand because uh, there's no other way to put it, um, th there's no way to indicate that you have now gone into another beach. Um, we, we can have a new sign on the road, and I've talked to Tom Hall about that new sign maybe going up. But on the beach itself, um, when, you, when you talk about monitoring is that part of the monitoring to make sure that people who have dogs from Old Orchard and they're walking across and it's 9.30 in the morning and they can keep their dogs on the beach until 10, they don't realize that they have, they have crossed into another beach. So I think that the ongoing committee would have to be thinking about that particular aspect. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else? I'm going to close the public comments section of the meeting. Okay. Close. <coughs> okay. Uh, acceptance of the February 19th regular meeting minutes. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Seeing none. Uh, are there any adjustments to the agenda? I have none. Okay. There are none. Uh, treasurer's warrants, I just signed them. Non-action items, uh, we have a presentation from the Transportation Advisory Committee. The Bacon Town Planner has been elected, appointed Nominated. to uh, speak on behalf of the committee, though I do notice uh, two members of the committee in the front row, and of course uh, Council Chair Sullivan has been the Council Liaison right along. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and, and Town Council. Um, as mentioned, I've been nominated to provide a presentation to you um, from the Transportation Committee on their work on a proposal for intersection improvements at Oak Hill uh, focused on pedestrian and, and safety improvements at the intersection. Um, the committee has been uh, working away um, for over a year, I think closer to two years now, um, after the council established a transportation committee with the chief's uh, first initiative to, to look at the Oak Hill intersection and the surrounding area with an eye towards making pedestrian improvements and, and safety improvements. 
and the committee has been using some past studies as guides in their in their process. The townwide transportation study back in 2005, the Oak Hill intersection study in 06, and most recently uh, the pedestrian plan from 2011. And um, it's pretty remarkable uh, given, it's pretty remarkable uh, about how much has already been accomplished in this area in light of the 2011 <coughs> pedestrian plan. Um, and it's really been a collective effort uh, to date. Um, as you approved last year and as you observed in the fall, um, some major improvements were made to Black Point Road. Sidewalks were added by the town on the west side and by private development on the east side in front of the assisted living facility. Coupled with that initiative, um, the, a crosswalk improvement was done down at the Eastern Road in Black Point. It's 90% uh, complete, but uh, the 10% is a pretty key one uh, that will be done this spring, and that's adding some uh, signalized uh, crosswalk there so p pedestrians can actuate a, a crosswalk um, lights and have a lot more visibility and safety in crossing. So that's been done by the town uh, just this past fall. Um, also this past fall and winter, um, Bitterford Savings Bank, that project has installed crosswalks at Hannaford Drive in Route 1 and some sidewalks along Route 1 in Centerville will be doing that when they come forward with their office project. And um, looking forward, uh, the school department has committed to and, and will be installing an improved crosswalk at Hannaford Drive. Um, it's crossing of Gorham Road, which is a pretty important crossing, particularly for school kids um, going to and from uh, the, the campus over to Hannaford Drive and Oak Hill Plaza and beyond. Um, and lastly, uh, Maine DOT has um, awarded the town significant funding to further the sidewalk and pedestrian initiative up uh, Gorham Road to Sawyer Road. Um, there's a couple important sidewalk extensions there, one from the library up to Sawyer Road. Another is the Oak Hill Plaza side of Gorham Road between Hannaford Drive and, and the intersection. Um, and DOT found the town worthy um, of that funding under the <coughs> Safe Routes to School program. So that's looking to be moving forward probably a year or two from now. Um, and so there's a pretty diverse partnership of and, and funding sources to really further this area as a more walkable place and a safer place for, for kids to getting to school and people walking around. If I could just interject and make a, a key point, just for the benefit of council, uh, this is a great example of where investment in plans and planning produces this sort of result, and we don't need to use all town funds to do it. So it, by virtue of the fact that we had good, solid plans in place, we're able to impress upon private development applicants uh, the need to do these things. It ranks us much higher uh, for competitive, very competitive grant funding. So we very much appreciate your support of these, these studies that end up, um, this is the fruits of, of that labor. Thanks, Tom. Um, and really the key piece at this point, looking at that uh, map on the past slide, and I realize it's a small map given where you're seated, so uh, I apologize for that. But what remains is, um, a key linkage is the ominous Oak Hill intersection. Um, just given its size and the traffic that moves through it, is, it's an intimidating place for, pe for pedestrians to cross, um, and, but it's an important linkage for the Eastern Trail um, and the neighborhoods to the south along Black Point Road and the new sidewalks along Black Point Road, <coughs> thinking to really the, the end destinations being the town campus, the schools, Oak Hill, Plaza and those businesses, and um, the majority of destinations really being on the other side of uh, Route 1. And so that's, over the past year, what the committee has really been focused on is figuring out what is the right balance <coughs> of pedestrian improvements that make it more appealing to get across Route 1, safer to get across Route 1, um, but not, you know, hinder traffic by doing it and not uh, taking out multiple lanes to make it a, um, the perfect crossing for pedestrians. So the committee has been really looking at that balance. Um, they've been looking at other needed safety improvements around the Elk Hill intersection. There's some high crash locations that have existed for a number of years. And in this package of proposals, there's a few adjustments that we think will 
uh, improve those high craft locations. And as a, a final element, the committee's been looking at, okay, is there ways to make the intersection just more attractive and also better for stormwater, safer on the environment, given that intersections are known for high pollution levels, given that there's always a lot of cars queued up waiting to move through the intersection. That's where on roadways the most pollutants um, enter the road system. So after a lot of discussion and advice from our traffic consultant, the town engineer, um, and a lot of uh, debate at the committee level, um, this is the package of improvements the, the committees like to recommend to you. Um, first and foremost, to uh, put in some improved crosswalks. Um, there, currently, there are two crosswalks today. One is, goes from Amato's to the gas station across the street, um, being, I think it's mobile. They change pretty yearly. Um, and then there's a crosswalk today from mobile over to Walgreens. The committee's looked at this a lot and feels that there also should be one from the Sitco station to Walgreens, given the new sidewalk at the assisted living facility and some other destinations uh, to the south along Black Point Road. So this shows those three crosswalks. It also shows shorter new protection islands that can provide more safety for a pedestrian or more comfort for a pedestrian crossing the roadway because there's some curbed um, narrow medians within Route 1 and then also Gorham Road. The other key element here is the idea of basically combining the right turn lane that exists today with through right, uh, meaning actually eliminating the right turn lane that exists along Walgreens and making the right through lane a through right, if that <laughs> makes sense. Um, for two reasons, but in this particular uh, instance, one key reason would be to make it a shorter crossing for pedestrians. What actually also helps motorists because it shortens <coughs> the length of red time that you're using for a pedestrian to cross. Um, that right turn lane has been studied uh, quite significantly, and it's 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 used at a very low rate compared to all the other lanes in the intersection. And it's a pretty redundant turn lane because of Hannaford Drive and also motorist's ability to use Oak Hill Plaza for, for different movements. So it's, it's not a critical lane and it's also not used um, a fraction of the time compared to all the other lanes in the intersection. Another improvement the committee is recommending is um, dynamic no right on red signs when someone's in the crosswalk. Um, this wouldn't prohibit a motorist from taking a right on red when someone's not in the crosswalk, but when someone's using a crosswalk, often a motorist isn't looking at pedestrians, they're looking to see if they can take a right. Um, so having a lit sign that lights up in your line of vision is a key to both motorist mm -hmm. safety and, most importantly, pedestrian safety. The elimination of the right turn lane um, along Walgreens uh, frontage there also could be used for stormwater treatment. We've been looking at, I mentioned the pollutant loading at the intersection. Uh, the runoff of the road runs towards that curb line. There's mm -hmm. already catch basins there. And there's a nice opportunity to actually provide some stormwater treatment in that what would be a new esplanade area. Um, which can benefit ultimately the watersheds in the, in the marsh uh, that it drains into. So that was sort of a creative and uh, you, a creative way to, to use that esplanade for something more than just green space. It could be stormwater treatment. Um, coupled with this is the proposal to construct a shorter length of sidewalk that could complete the linkage from the assisted living facility that went on Black Point Road. They built a sidewalk, but they didn't build it all the way to the intersection. Um, the Sitco station does not have a sidewalk along it, so this would complete that sidewalk connection up to the intersection. I mentioned earlier safety uh, for motorists, and one of the two higher accident areas in Oak Hill is the <coughs> driveway in and out of the Sitco station on Black Point Road. It's mm -hmm. a very 
problematic driveway. It's tricky to get in and out of, particularly in the commuter hour. There's a lot of crashes associated with it. We looked at a lot of different alternatives here um, and decided on really a, a narrowing and, and kind of realigning of the driveway so it's not as broad. Um, motorists need to be more deliberate about going in and out. Um, and if it's narrower, um, some that are trying to take a left in a busy time of day might think twice before they go out that way. Um, and also, there's a little island there to channelize motorists so that they're uh, using it properly, not cutting across uh, the driveway. So this is kind of coupled with this, the sidewalk improvements, but an important safety improvement for folks using uh, that driveway. The other safety improvement that was is proposed by the committee is to have what we're calling a textured center island. Um, it would be drive mountable, drivable down between the fire station and the Elk Hill intersection, much like the concrete textured surface that's on the other side of the intersection in front of McDonald's in Arlberg. Um, the, the accident problem that's occurring is motorists are using that center left turn lane inappropriately as a travel lane, trying to get up to the left turn lane while other motors are coming out of side streets and are causing an accident. Um, this has been identified as by the committee as something to, to improve upon. So having a surface that's not comfortable to drive on can cut down on those speeding down the left turn lane, mm -hmm. and we think, mm -hmm. well, less than that likelihood of um, a collision there. And lastly, um, there's the, the committee's talked about having just street lighting at each corner of the intersection to provide more light to the intersection in the evening, uh, evening hours, both for motorists and pedestrians. Right now it's dimly lit, it's not well lit. Um, both for those using the crosswalk, and, but just as importantly, cars traveling through the intersection. This, these three more aerial, or well, one's a bird's eye view and, and street view, rather, perspectives kind of illustrate um, what the intersection could look like with some of these improvements. Um, and one view is from, the, the larger view is from Mottos looking across towards Walgreens. Um, the upper right view is looking from the mobile station towards the Walgreens. And lastly, uh, we wanted to present next steps. Tonight is a key presentation for the committee to the council to can present what they've been working on and get your feedback uh, following feedback and any adjustments. Uh, the budget process is, is beginning in the next month or two. Last year the council actually approved the CIP for funding for this intersection um, and that was when there wasn't a sidewalk and some of these other safety improvements that have now been folded in. So we would be coming forward with an additional CIP to um, enable the entire project to move forward at the same time. And it happens to be about the same amount of money the town actually currently has in our um, impact fee accounts from impact fees that are assigned to new development that go through the planning board process. So this is eligible to be used by for impact fees rather than uh, bonding or um, or town expenditure um, by the taxpayers. So that's an important point, is putting the impact fees to work that have been collected over the years. In addition to the CIP step, um, based on some feedback that we get from the council, we would need to coordinate with DOT on the design and then uh, enter into the final design stage for the project. And the thinking would be there's adequate time to design in May and June and be in a con position to <coughs> implement these improvements after the summer busy season, potentially in September, October, if that was the, the wishes of uh, the council and the town manager. Yeah, I, I just, uh, we, we're sensitive to construction fatigue. We've all, li in this town, have all lived through uh, endless seasons, it seems like all five years I've been here, we've had parts of Route 1 under varying degrees of construction. So 
though we may be ready, it's, it's physically possible for us to complete the work this fall, we may wish to push some of that off till spring just to give people a break, frankly. Uh, but that's, that's a point we can talk about. Yeah. <coughs> so that concludes my presentation. And Steve and Ron are here from the committee. And um, we'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Also, I should mention Jim Wendell, town engineer, is here and has been uh, active and a part of the whole process right along. Is there any questions? Good. <coughs> questions? No. <coughs> okay, thank you. Richard, let me, let me just ask. Oh, yep. Dan, I mean, one of the things that I, I mean, this is the best town I've ever seen that could benefit from some greater curb appeal at Oak Hill. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned greening up the area. Uh, I, I would think a more aggressive plan uh, that addresses landscape, streetscape, uh, trees, uh, <coughs> to soften mm -hmm. the intersection. I think that it would do wonders. And I think that, and I think it would be very well received in the town by the, by the community. Yep. The committee's talked a fair amount about that and it's like with Dunstan Corner and the Haggis Parkway intersection. We've tried to add some greenery and softening the intersection while also balancing the, the maintenance obligations and the cost, the ongoing cost of maintaining the infrastructure. Um, so I, that's kind of that balancing act as making it more attractive but being able to afford to maintain it and maintain it well. Um, so I'd, the raised islands would be landscaped like those other intersections. Um, they're shorter islands though, so that maintenance doesn't go on uh, too many linear feet. And uh, the idea with the stormwater facility along Walgreens is that it would be a, a landscaped stormwater system that's more contemporary in style. Um, and some tree plantings. So, and, and the committee, I think, can talk more about, you know, additional street trees if that's something um, the council wishes us to do. Certainly. All, all these matters will come before the uh, finance committee in detail through the CRP requests, and certainly I encourage you all to be part of that conversation. And ultimately, should it, we be successful at that level, we'll come to you as part of the budget proposal. Right. Thank you, Dan. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Order number 14-13 is a 730 public hearing and second reading on the proposed amendments to Chapter 405, the zoning ordinance to repeal contract zone District 4 between the Town of Scarborough and Harold P. Burnham II. Okay. Open the public hearing on order number 14-13. <coughs> is there anyone here that would like to speak on the order? Seeing none. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Okay, all those in favor? Opposed. Thank you. Under new business order number 1424, is first reading and refer to the planning board the proposed amendment to chapter 405, the zoning <coughs> to add historic preservation and wildlife review standards to enable a municipal capacity of DEP site law review. I dropped the ball on that one. Mm. Dan Bacon will be presenting. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I'm going to provide introduction really to Order 1424 through 26. They're all uh, a package together, and they all have similar language. They're just the three different land use ordinances that uh, the planning board administers, the zoning ordinance the site plan review ordinance and the subdivision ordinance. Um, and this is before you because the town is interested and has applied for what's called municipal capacity of the DEP site location permitting process. Um, site location or site laws, it's called by the development community, is the DEP review process for larger development projects, um, large commercial projects, larger subdivisions, and it's a process that 
really covers a lot of the same review criteria that the planning board does in the town's development review process. Um, and it's, it's an important review process, um, but it's probably more important for communities that don't have the same level of ordinances and review as Scarborough. And, and it can be pretty time consuming and expensive um, for applicants to go through. And so given the comprehensive nature of our ordinances and our planning board's abilities and our engineering review abilities, we felt the town was in pretty good position to apply for and receive what's called municipal capacity, um, which is allowed by the state. And basically the state finds that your ordinances are equal to and serve the same purposes as the site law review. And um, so we've applied for this in September as a way to streamline development review to eliminate some duplication occurring at the state level and the town level and to encourage development in our growth areas. And um, DEP has reviewed our ordinances <coughs> so they are. Um, <coughs> We do have the capacity. They are uh, entitled to municipal capacity with a few adjustments. And that's what's before you tonight on these three orders are those few adjustments. And they center around our review of historic resources, historic and archaeological sites and, and buildings, etc. And for larger projects, um, they also focus on giving the main Inland Fisheries and Wildlife Department a chance to comment on larger projects, which they already do under site law. And so I felt this was fitting <coughs> too, given the historic committees, all their recent work on historic preservation, and it's good timing in that regard. And so to this end, uh, what you have before you are essentially the same uh, amendments to those three ordinances that say that development projects um, should check and identify whether they have historic resource within their development project, and they would check the town's comprehensive plan, the main historic preservation commission's list, and then any list the town might have. And I know there was a list presented at your last meeting. It's not an official list yet, but it could become the town's list of historic properties. And then they check to see if their projects um, and contains any of those resources. And then they're asked to see if there's a way to preserve those resources part of the project. But it's not a requirement. Um, they can check and see, and if it's not feasible, they can indicate that to the planning board after doing some homework on it and then choose not to preserve it. But it's just a, a step along the way to see if it's possible and to also just recognize that they have such a resource. Um, so. In a nutshell, those are the amendments before you. Um, and with adoption of these changes, um, then the town would be in a position to have municipal capacity and then applicants wouldn't be going to the state for that, that step at DEP. Um, and I thought it was important to note that uh, under site law, that isn't DEP review of wetland filling or impacts to critical wildlife or endangered wildlife habitat, that kind of thing. So that review still happens at the state. That's not something the town can get authority on. So from an environmental standpoint, we still have those environmental protections and those steps at the state level. Um, and I guess as a, a final note, um, Long Range Planning Committee has reviewed this, and also just last night the Historic um, Preservation Committee uh, reviewed the proposal and has some we worked on a slight adjustment to the language in light of comments last night that's before you this right. evening. We apologize, but what was distributed this evening with the <coughs> highlight, I believe, captures the input from the Historic Preservation Correct. Group last night. Yeah. So we apologize for kind of the late lateness of it but uh, it makes sense for you to consider that version in first reading so you can get this process started uh, you know, on the right foot. Thanks. Thank you, Dan. Do we have a motion? Approval? Public comment? What's that? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I apologize. I missed that. All right. Yep. Sorry. Well, this is what I came down here and I 
I don't think we should have a historical thing, preservation committee. Uh, if you're talking about a pile of bricks eight feet by ten feet and you're going to preserve these things, there, there should be restrictions. I don't want the town to take and distort the economics behind development for the sake of, of, of saving a barn or the widow's walk or something that's not economically practical. And I would really think a better idea to leave this historical preservation thing off the table. So the environment, the state will take care of that. You've got enough rules there. But I don't want to preserve a bunch of junk. That's all i got to say. Okay, thank you. Hey, anyone else? Okay, I'll close the public comment. Do I have a motion? Move approval. Second. Discussion. Okay. Dan, can you identify for us the uh, kinds of communities? You said it's it's not particularly fraud. That, that have this capacity? Yes. Um, the city of Portland and the city of Saco both do in our area. I think those are the only communities that have either what they call municipal capacity, uh, which means local ordinances are, are good enough or, or meet the needs of the state, or delegated authority, which means site law is still reviewed. It's just reviewed by the town. So the rules of site law are reviewed by the town. So those are the two towns that I'm aware of in our vicinity that have this Ability. Am I correct that this is a transfer of responsibility as opposed to an expansion of responsibility? It's it's actually a finding that um, site law criteria doesn't need to be met at all because the town's ordinances are equal to the intent of the site law rules. So we're not actually acting state, as the state. State site law. Yes, state rules. <clears throat> so we're not acting as a state. We've been found by the state to have adequate rules to um, essentially uphold. So it eliminates that step. It eliminates that process. step, correct, mm -hmm. which can be a six-month step mm -hmm. and a twenty to $50,000 step for applicants. It just if I could dovetail, Dan, Dan's being entirely too modest. Uh, a lot of the, the reason that we're in a position to obtain this municipal capacity has to do with <coughs> Dan and his staff mm -hmm. and, frankly, the, the quality of the ordinances that largely he's the author of. Um, so he, he should take and be given a lot of credit for putting us in this position. Sir. Ron Mesa, I'm on the planning board as well as the transportation committee and the pedestrian committee, so I got a vested interest. But uh, I just want to echo what Tom just said. When uh, any of these projects uh, come before the planning board, uh, we take very seriously the ordinances uh, that exist now. And uh, to emphasize uh, what what the purpose is is to make it a streamline for anybody, an applicant who comes. Uh, to the town uh, and saves them a great deal of ex expense. And talking with Dan and staff, it's expensive for somebody mm -hmm. that uh, to go up to Augusta and have this site plan on their shoulders as opposed to the way we do. But I want to assure the council that the ordinances that we have are probably the toughest and best and yet the fairest that in the area. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Is there any more questions of Dan? Comments, Councilor Holbrook. Um, I would just uh, like to offer um, one friendly um, amendment, in which is to accept uh, the document you have in front of you, which is essentially the same document you had before. So your, I believe this one is the 405 zoning ordinance. Um, the only one change that comes to you in this document is just on that ending piece about the um, <coughs> historical. Site. You'll see it's highlighted in yellow. Um, there was intention to bring in, um, it was just taking <coughs> the wording a little bit to better reflect that um, the outreach for a contractor to do would be 
or um, for the planning board would be to have um, the historic society play an advisory role to them about just what's you know important about these little sites locations. You know, especially when you're talking site, you know, subdivision. You know, if if we can have wiggle room with there so that it could just be talking to each other. It doesn't create. Um, there was concern before that the way it was worded, it kind of made it sound like they were the authoritative figure behind what this, and, and they're just looking to have more of an advisory role with, with town staff. So, just procedurally, thank um, you. Uh, it's, your your amendment may not be necessary. My impression of your motion, which I think you made, was that you were moving this version, but. If that's not if that's not the original motion, then the amendment would be required. I can move the You're March the fifth the version instead of the version yeah. that was in your packet. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the one that's in front of us today. That's what you got tonight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> so if that's the case, I don't think an amendment's required. It's already um, active in front of the council by by virtue of your initial motion. Okay. All right. We have to have your amendment withdrawn. I withdraw my motion. And second. <laughs> no second. No second. I thought I heard a second. <coughs> I'm sure I okay. did. Okay. Okay. Well, okay, back to the original motion. Make a comment? Yes. Still <laughs> <on> that comment <laughs> phase. Um, so uh, this is uh, certainly just the first step of many, as you know. Um, historic Pre Preservation has been trying to really look at what we can do to help encourage um, and certainly, as the direction of the council was, that the um, point is to encourage. It was not to um, require it or enforce it or strong on it. It was just to do everything possible that we could to make sure that we've really looked at what we have that's important and significant. Um, I, I do do appreciate, um, you know, that there is some concern that we would be saving junk. I assure you what we're looking at on the list. We had a first crack um, presentation to you guys of kind of what we were looking at. These sites are absolutely historically significant. You know, the Winslow Homer home, um, you know, there's the Woolly Mammoth site. There's a lot of things that are, um, you know, Scarborough for a long time unfortunately has had that well, you just bulldoze it and oh well kind of attitude and, and there should be some things that are left somewhat sacred and um, the town should do everything humanly possible to try to preserve it without enforcing it upon people and to make it as easy as possible as we can. So um, Dan has been extremely helpful um, to the committee in this and, and it's his language that has made um, <coughs> this portion possible. Um, and you know, we have... Um, all three documents coming up will have the similar thing where it's just that one tweak in the wording. Um, but certainly this is hopefully only the first step of many, many other good ideas to come. So again, um, it just creates an advisory role to find out what's significant about, about the property. From what I'm hearing around town, there's quite a bit of interest in historical preservation. I uh, hear people come up to me all the time about it and, and uh, say that they're glad that the town finally is doing something about it. Um, they wish that the widow's walk could have been saved long before it fell into disrepair and wasn't worth saving. So uh, maybe we can change things around with saving some of these uh, historical buildings before they get so bad that they're a pile of junk. Any other comments? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? None. Order number 1425 is the first reading and schedule a public hearing on the proposed amendments to Chapter 405D, the Site Plan Review Ordinance, to add historic preservation and wildlife review standards to enable municipal cap capacity of DEP site law review. Public comment. Anyone like to speak on this issue? Seeing none, close public comment. Do I have a motion? So moved. moved. <laughs> so moved and seconded. Second. Comments? I'll, I'll give another comment. Uh, again, certainly this is just, um, it, it goes dovetail with the rest of it that just says, um, kind of like we were talking about before, um, as far as the historic piece of it is just to encourage it and take a better look at it, um, especially as it comes in front of um, the planning board for site plan review. 
um, to just have a more thorough look and thought about what might be on that parcel. Very good. Okay. Anyone else? Looking down that end of the table. <laughs> Nothing, huh? Nothing going on, huh? Satisfactory. Up there? No? I no. guess so. Okay. Um, all those in favor? Opposed? Order number 14-26 is the first reading and schedule a public hearing on the proposed amendments to Chapter 406, the subdivision ordinance to add historic preservation and wildlife review standards to enable municipal capacity of DEP site law review. <coughs> and once again, any from one from the public would like to speak on this? Anybody? Seeing none, I have a motion. Move approval. Second. Discussion. Want to do this one again? Sure. <laughs> uh, just to go back again, it's the advisory, and I guess I'm, I, I will change my. I'll change it up a little bit. I'll read the last line. How's that? Uh, if the resource will be removed, the applicant must demonstrate that reasonable efforts have been made to preserve the resource value and relocate it to another section. So again, just to my point, um, there's some language in here that if it's not worth saving and it can't be saved, <coughs> yeah, it can go. Guys are off quiet down there. Nothing <laughs> still? Coffee. <laughs> sleep. Okay. Seeing no comments from the council, um, move, uh, we're going to uh, take a vote. All those in favor? Opposed? Okay. Order number 14-27 is act on the annual seasonal road postings for weight restrictions if necessary from February 25th to May 15th. As hard as it may be to believe, uh, <laughs> the frost will be coming out of the ground soon. Uh, <laughs> And so this is an annual really rite of passage, believe. if you will. Um, but this is a, I, I don't mean to make light of it, it's very important to protect the integrity of our roads. <coughs> right. Tom, why is it that we have to, why does the town council have to approve something like this? Well, I believe it has to do, uh, this is in fact <coughs> affects uh, commerce. Uh, this doesn't allow uh. trucks to be on the roads, and so I think it's important that the council, the legislative body, uh, takes a formal vote that will re that effectively restricts uh, the right of commerce and trucks to be able <coughs> to traverse your roads. Okay. Thank you. Motion. So moved. Second. Thank you. I don't believe there's any discussion, is there, on this? Mm -mm. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Whoa. Okay. Um, is living on a road that gets one of these postings, I would like to, and I don't know how to go about it, I would like to see these cardboard orange signs larger. Okay. If you're going down the road, you almost can't read them. Okay. I'll check into it. Good observation. Uh, there okay. seems to be some standardization as I think about State. traveling State. around right. different different towns. I yeah. see similar signs, but I'll have <coughs> to see if we have the ability to put larger ones. Anyone up there? No. All those in favor? No. Thank you. Order <coughs> number 1428 is act on the request to authorize the town manager to sign and accept the sewer easement with the Sea Ridge Subdivision Homeowners Association. Tom. Uh, you caught me flat footed. Oh, um, <laughs> no, 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 quite all right. Uh, this is uh, simply a, a housekeeping matter, uh, picking up on something that we thought was done. Uh, it uh, <coughs> has the council affir affirm or approve. Uh, an easement for, for the purpose of having a sanitary sewer system exist within the public right-of-way in the Sea Ridge subdivision. Uh, this was always intended to be the case. I think it just fell through the cracks, and um, I think we became aware of it uh, as this project was purchased by um, a new developer who was kind of scrutinized all the paperwork, and again, it's just housekeeping. I have a motion. So moved. Is there any discussion? 
All those in favor? Opposed. Thank you. Okay, standing in special committees. Start with Councilor Blaze. Um, earlier this week, uh, Bud Hansen, the chairman of the Senior Advisory Board, uh, Ali Hodge, who is the Senior uh, coordinator. coordinator for Programs, Senior Program Coordinators, and myself met with Andrea Killiard, uh, who is the um, Marketing Director at Piper Shores, along with Anthony uh, <coughs> Ketch, who is the Community Services Director over there. Uh, we just sat down and we discussed uh, like problems, like goals, um, how can we help each other. Um, and it was amazing, five minutes into the meeting, it was quite evident that both sides wanted to help each other and that uh, uh, hopefully something new will be born as far as improving services to our seniors through Piper Shores, through expanding the uh, services of the town. So uh, it was just a start, but I'll keep you posted as to things that mm -hmm. will transpire. Hey, okay, thank you. Council Benedict. Um, excuse me, and uh, no meetings on the committees that I'm on in February goes to Waters, but there is one next Tuesday night, so I will be in attendance. That's it. Thank you. Councilor Holbrook. Uh, well, as you see, there's part of um, historic preservation was here this evening. Mm -hmm. Um, so they did meet last night. Um, bulk of the conversation was around this, and um, they are working on um, some other ideas. Those will be at the next meeting, which will be March 20th. Uh, I'm sorry, looking at the wrong committee. Um, April 8th at 6.30 p.m. Uh, there's been some concepts, and, and again, Dan bacon has been very helpful in helping us kind of try to figure out how to cross the language for it. Um, there's some concepts about um, <coughs> possible density bonuses um, for some of these sites. Um, if they realize and keep the part that's historic about it, maybe having some kind of bonus so it makes it more enticing to the developer to want to keep it um, and, and an incentive to, to do it. Um, so there's some talk around that. Um, again, the list is ever-changing and evolving and argued about about what's, what's significant. Um, you know, and the eye in the beholder a little bit, so I'm um, still chugging away on the list. Um, I do want to mention that that committee is looking for members. Um, uh, very, very specifically, um, we did have one member resign, which leaves us a little short um, for members. So if there's any interest in the community um, to, to help out with the historic preservation, um, <coughs> your help would be greatly appreciated. Um, and as always, there are openings on several committees. Um, you can get a link right online on the town website to fill out an application. Um, Housing Alliance has its next meeting on March 20th at 6.30. And yeah, that's it for today's on report. Councilor Donovan. Uh, the uh, Finance Committee met with the School Board Finance Committee. And, and that was a very productive discussion. I uh, was very uh, uh, pleased to hear their attitudes. Uh, they were, it was a very cooperative <coughs> and a good exchange because I thought it was a candid exchange about uh, the tax situation in the town and the factors that were involved. And so I think the townspeople will appreciate knowing that uh, uh, this finance committee is working at those, uh, those tax issues. And that's going to be a very busy period for the next several months. And I want to... Uh, uh, I want to personally thank the um, uh, the council for hanging in there on the uh, on the uh, dog issue. It really is not easy when it requires constant adjustments to understand and accept compromises that are complicated. Uh, and in this case, I think the uh, flexibility and willingness of the council to to keep working with me on those was really commendable. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. 
Council of Katerina. Uh, <clears throat> the only meeting I've been to since la our last meeting is the COG Regional Policy Forum, and basically, I can only hope they can do this, but rather than just sitting around writing reports, we'll actually act on a few of them um, and try to attract some resources so that we can get uh, some things done. Um, I know, I know personally there have been things in that community that have been around for 20 some odd years that are still sitting around. So they're going to be sorry they invited me to be on that committee, <laughs> but that's another story. Um, Long Range Planning Committee is this Friday morning at 8, and we're looking at um, some uh, planning around uh, Gorham Road near where I live, abutting where I live at the golf course and what we can do there. And the Conservation Commission is meeting on Monday at, we're moving it up to I believe 6 o'clock. Uh, and again, we've been asked to look at some potential um, subdivisions and whatnot that are maybe coming down the pike. So. Hey, thank you. Uh, my report was already done on the Transportation Committee tonight, so they made it easy. <laughs> Um, unfortunately, uh, Councilor Sinclair is uh, homesick and was able to was unable to attend uh, today's um, ordinance committee meeting and tonight's workshop and council meeting. And she said she's very very sorry, and but she just can't help it. She's sick. So what was uh, covered? at the uh, committee meeting today was cell phone towers, cell phone coverage in Scarborough. We've hired a consultant that is looking at areas of coverage in the town that is lacking. And uh, the providers are very interested in working with, uh, with the town and with the uh, um, report that's going to be out um, for coverage to uh, try to help as best they can to reinstate uh, good coverage around town. So that that's pretty exciting. Uh, it was a lengthy meeting. There was a lot of public comment <coughs> at the meeting, um, and uh, I think we learned a lot. Uh, we also uh, spoke about uh, medical marijuana facilities that already exist in town um, and how to better manage them uh, you know through you know through our ordinances and um, we had quite a few public you know people come up and public comment some from experience and uh, some gave us some advice as to uh, uh, things that we should be looking at in our ordinance uh, so it was uh, Pretty educational. Mm -hmm. And then the uh, last thing was uh, we <coughs> updated our um, traffic ordinance, which will be coming to you to more mirror um, what the state uh, recommends and the wording <coughs> to uh, bring you know both uh, our ordinances uh, in line with the state. We also spoke about the <coughs> parking on the Pine Point Road. Mm -hmm. and uh, a possible solution that will come before the council um, in, in the parking ordinance the, 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 out of the adjustments that were made to that. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the only way that we're going to find out um, whether this will work is to try it for a summer and see if that, what we decide to do, alleviates the problem down there. So that will do it for my comments. So it's on to um, town manager's report. Thank you. Just a couple of quick points of interest. Uh, working with the council chair, and you'll see you have co copies of the financial audit and financial reports. Uh, it was slightly delayed this year, but I think still in time where we can get a presentation and consume that document before we get involved in budget. Um, to that end, we are looking to arrange a joint workshop with the school board, which is tradition, <coughs> for, the, for the presentation of the audit, um, and that will be before your next meeting. That's March 19th. We haven't finalized the time, but I'm guessing it will be in the 6:15 range. Uh, we usually need a bit more than half an hour to get through right. it. Uh, again, a reminder, uh, next week, March 13, 
uh, here in these chambers, the Scarborough Land Trust will be holding its annual meeting, and you've got a preview of the sort of uh, subjects they'll cover. Um, everyone I've attended, I've been astounded. These chambers are full, uh, so it's a real testament mm -hmm. to how right. interested this community and committed they are to uh, to this cause of conservation. I also provide the council an update on winter operations through our Public Works Department. Come, should come as no surprise. Uh, it's been a harsh winter. Our budgets uh, show that. Uh, look, simplistically, looking at uh, how we compare this year to last year, we're about 25 percent up uh, for winter operations. Frankly, all things considered, uh, I'm pretty happy about that being where we're at. And we've made arrangements elsewhere in the public works budget to compensate for those uh, over expenditures in those particular lines. And lastly, just a plug for community services. Uh, last year, they took over passport uh, duties. And uh, last year, they held their first inaugural passport day. And uh, this year, it's scheduled for this coming Saturday, March 8th, 8 to 10, here at Town Hall. And it's kind of a blitz. It's an opportunity for folks to come in on the weekend hours uh, when it's perhaps more convenient uh, to get their passports. And uh, I don't know how many we processed last year, but it clearly was a success, and we look for a similar turnout. So again, this Saturday, 10 to 3, uh, come here to Town Hall, and we'll help you process your passport. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Councilor comments. We'll start with Councilor Holbrook. Um, I have two comments this evening. Um, the first one is um, I know there was some interest um, for, from some folks about um, the clink bags. The town does have clink yep. bags in. We have another order of uh, 100 boxes that are in. So if you're interested in collecting a bag or two, um, all the proceeds will go to the um, Project Grace fuel assistance fund that we partner up with every year, so um, there are more bags here at Town Hall. They're right in uh, the clerk's office, in so the clerk's they're, office. they're <laughs> easy to get. Feel free to grab some if you'd like some. Um, and then just um, one, I, I don't have, I'm, I'll do the full list of condolences at the next meeting, but um, I do have one. Um, Olaf Alquist passed away. Um, he was not a lifetime resident, but certainly a longtime resident. He grew up here. He was one of one of the siblings of my grandmother. Um, his brother Clarence recently passed away as well. Um, but again, um, grew up actually in the house I live in. So um, again, I'd like to extend my condolences to the family. And then that, that's it for me. Thank you. I, I, I would like to applaud community service, the representative uh, who does the passports up there. Uh, I had a lost passport. Some gentleman in Naples, Italy has my passport <laughs> <laughs> at the moment. And so they, they walked me through that process very, very professionally. So I really appreciated it. Good. Thank you. <laughs> Good one, Bill. Um, Councilor Katarina. Yeah, just a couple things. Um, I'd like to congratulate the Scarborough Academic Decathlon team. I believe that this was their 25th win. I know it was their 10th consecutive win. Uh, I'm partial to the team because my daughter is an alum of the team, so I was very excited to see that. And I did go to Super Quiz and uh, watch the kids win. And they are trying to raise money to go to the Nationals. The Nationals are in Honolulu, Hawaii. I happened to go to Honolulu in, I don't know, 2006 or 2007. They went to Honolulu then also. But obviously it takes a lot of money. So um, you can contact uh, Shane Davis. is a Latin teacher at the high school, and he has um, he's doing the fundraising. He's their coach. Um, I had a counselor meeting at Dunstan Station. I had six people came, and I believe we had a fruitful conversation. It's great to have face-to-face -face, uh, with folks <coughs> about issues and whatever, so I thank them all for coming. They were happy because I had coffee and donuts for them. Um, <clears throat> speaking of clink bags, I am now being called the bag lady here at Town Hall. <laughs> I've, given <Effectively>, out <laughs> I've yeah. given out probably 35 clink bags. I bring them with me. I don't happen to have any. I forgot to bring them, but I usually have them wherever I go and... Uh, force them upon people. No, I don't do that. But, um, it, you know, I appreciate people taking them because, as Jessica said, it's helping our neighbors in need uh, with a fuel assistance fund. And it doesn't take very, well, at least in my house, it doesn't take very long to fill a clink bag. So uh, thank you for that. That's it. Uh, Councilor Benedict. Very quiet tonight. <laughs> <laughs> 
I've noticed that. Well, you told me to be. Well, you want to try to get through this. Okay. I'm done. Council Blaze. Um, I'd just like to, again, thank the ad hoc committee uh, <clears throat> for a wonderful job that they did. I, that was one, one big project. And they're based upon where we started to where we ended up, mm -hmm. you could see all the different possibilities just floating all over the place. Um, I'm glad everybody hung in there. I know after the last workshop, a lot of people were upset, but uh, um, I think in the end, uh, what came out tonight was a very, very uh, positive uh, resolution. And I, I think we've got a year ahead of us that we can take a look and, and see whether we can make a difference in our plover population and yet still provide uh, off-leash time for the dog owners. Mm -hmm. and, it, and I'd like to especially thank Bill Donovan mm -hmm. for all the hours that he put in after the ad hoc committee. Um, thank you, Bill. I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, I'm up. Um, I'd like to give my condolences go out to Jessica and the Elquist family. And uh, I'd like to thank the Ad Hoc Committee for all the hard work that they put in and effort. I know there was a lot of hours spent, and I have to remember that our town manager was there also. So I thank you, too, for all the time you took <coughs> to uh, be there at those meetings and facilitate them. And you also, Bill, I know you put in a lot of time when you, you have a big project going on on your hands in your private life. So, um, I, you know, I'm not saying that everybody else doesn't, but um, I'm in, in on top of your council duty. So um, it's greatly appreciated. Uh, I think I'm hoping that uh, what came out tonight um, is going to be, I guess, Somewhat po met with somewhat of a positive light and and accepted and like we said um, you know once we get through a year of that uh, we'll know better how it works and how um, the community is, deals with it and if it and if it, it it may work well time will time will have to tell on that. So with that, um, I'm going to call for adjournment. Motion. All those in favor? Aye. Sir.